the standard template library is a set of collections that come with C++. So we've been using these Stanford collections that were written here by our professors, and uh, they are custom for Stanford. And they're basically only used here at Stanford. They're internal. But you might have wondered, like, why are we using those? You know, what, what do most people do if they don't go to Stanford and they want to use data structures in C++? What do they do? Well, they use this. They use the STL, the library of data structures that comes with the language. And it's, the S is for standard, so it's a standard part of the language. Any major version of C++ will have these things. And maybe it would surprise you, actually. Like, why did we use Stanford collections when there were standard collections? You know? <laughs> that F made a lot of difference, right? Or the A, too, I guess. Why, why would we do that, right? Um, well, let me show you. Let me show you what the real data structures do and what ours do, and let's compare and contrast. Let's talk about it. Um, so here's a table. I don't think it came out perfectly on my, my slide, but here's the types that we learned, and over there on the right is the equivalent, like, real type. So, like, we used uh, grid in Game of Life. And in the real world, there's no grid. You just make a two-dimensional array, and that's basically the same as a grid. So you do that. Why didn't we use a 2D array? Well, the syntax is kind of icky. You have to use some pointers and stuff. We didn't want to do pointers. But um, if you want a, a map, there's a map. A lot of them, it's just as simple as lowercasing the name of it. The standard C++ collections have lowercase data types for the names. Priority Q has a lowercase p and an underscore and stuff like that. They have a Q, they have a stack. They pretty much have all of our stuff. Why do we even, why do we reinvent the wheel? Why do we rewrite all of these things? Most of them are, are present. There's a few, like lexicon is missing, but the, I think what someone would say is just use a set. You don't need a lexicon. Um, and, I mean, it's not all included here, but there are actually some that come with the standard library that we don't have in ours. So, again, it raises this question of, like, why did we not use the STL? Well, let me do one comparison first. So, like, here's vector. So, we, get, we showed you vector. We taught you vector. That's the Stanford vector. There is a standard vector, a normal uh, vector. And, again, the, the lowercase v is the first main difference. And <clears throat> here's a table of the methods from theirs versus ours. And a lot of them are basically the same. Some of them have goofy names. I love this. M place. What? What's M place? I've never used that word in my life. But... Um, uh, the one I think is the crappiest is there's no add method. There's push back. What? Why do they call it that? I think it's because the stack pushes, and they wanted it to be called push everywhere, but I think it's a bad call. I think you should have called it add. But anyway, it has a lot of the same kind of methods, all right? And so if I, if I were to show you a, a, a demo, here is some code with our Stanford vector, right? We make a vector, just add some stuff to it, and now it has that. And then I want to insert something at the front. And I want to remove something from index 2. You know, just a really simple vector example. How do I make it work with uh, um, the STL vector? So I think I have that in Qt Creator also. Uh, let me see. STL example. So I think I have to rename the main here to not main. There. And then over here, I've got main. So the same example looks a little bit more like this. You push back instead of add. You, well, let me, I think I have the same code on the next slide. Let me just do that for a second. Um, here's the, do you like that fade? Here's the same code. <laughs> I want to see it again. I'm vain. I want to see it again. Oh, it's so pretty. Cool. So anyway, the STL vector, first of all, if you want to add, you just say push back. Instead of saying insert at index zero, you say insert at begin. And if you want to delete the element at index 2, instead of just saying remove parentheses 2, you say erase begin plus 2. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I'll explain that in just a second. But uh, here's a question. Do you recognize this method, erase? Have you seen a method called erase somewhere? Remember where? String. String. Turns out that the designers of these libraries, they have all pretty much exactly the same method names from string and vector. And uh, that's kind of interesting. You can, you can even substitute a string for a vector and vice versa in a lot of places in code. Kind of interesting uh, connection. But, okay, what are all these begins? I'll show you that in a second. But we'll come back to it. Here's a map example. The Stanford map, the one that we, the one that we learn in class. So you, you make a map, it takes a string and a double. The keys are strings, the values are doubles, right? You can set the values with the bracket notation. That's fine. 
I think this is me like reading some input and then I store. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Like the, the exact code isn't that important. If I want to know whether something is found in the map, I can say if it contains this key. Right? This is map stuff that we learned about. Same thing for the Stanford map. Looks like this. The M in map got lowercased. The syntax for creating it and putting stuff in it is pretty much identical. Here, this is identical. The one part of the slide that really changed was the bottom here. Look at this. You're trying to ask if something's contained. You ask if I find Coke and that's not equal to the end of price, then that means I found it. What? <laughs> so that's a little weird looking, right? But that's how you search for something in a Stanford map. Okay, well, but I keep seeing these like begins and ends, and I want to talk about what that means in, in, a, in a second here. But I hope you're seeing like it's not that different, right? It's not that bad. So again, why didn't you just teach me the real collections? Why didn't we just do this? If this is how you really do it, why didn't we just do this? Let me try to show you. What it really comes down to is what does it do when you fuck up? <laughs> because, I mean, we're learning, and so we will make mistakes, right? I mean, you guys all, we all have bugs when we're learning stuff, right? So let's make a Stanford vector. Let's add some stuff to it. And let's see, let me comment out a little bit of this. And then let's, okay, so here's, I'm printing V0, I think, wait, let me just, I've got some more code down there, I'll just turn it off. Uh, that's that map example. So, okay, up here, in, now, one thing, I don't know if, if I pointed out on the slide, one of the differences in the, in the vector versus our vector is how you include it. So if you want our vector, you say vector.h, right? You include vector.h. If you want the real STL vector, you use brackets and you say include vector. I don't know if you've really noticed this distinction, but if you want to use like system libraries, you use the brackets. And if you want to use local libraries that are in your little project, like ones I gave you or whatever, you use quotation marks. So anyway, for the moment, let's use vector.h, the Stanford one. And so what does this do? I make a vector, I add five integers, I, uh, I print out the first one of them, and then I print out the whole vector. It's really simple. So if I compile this, and I run it, it says v0 is 2, and then v is all that stuff. Right? Okay, fine. So let's change it to Stanford, or standard vector here. Okay, so, oh, oh wait, sorry, I want to do one more thing, which is, if I print element 0, that works out fine, but what if I try to print element 10, right? There's no element at index 10, right? So I think you know what it'll do, right? Kaboom, uh, error, exception, stack, trace. Oh, it came from line 22 of my, of my file. Oh, that's right here. Okay, so as a student, you can kind of go figure that out, right? Let's use the real vector. So if I use the real one, then let's see. I got to lowercase my v right here. I got to say push back here. And let me put this back to zero for a minute to the, the legal one. I compile it, and I actually have an error right away. It doesn't let me print the vector. So this is where the poo-poo begins. Like, the real vector doesn't know how to print itself. And so if you want to print it, you have to, like, write a loop to loop over it and print every element. What a pain in the ass. That sucks. I haven't, how many times have you printed out a collection just to see what was in it? Nope, can't do it. Sorry. Get out. Or, like, write the code yourself for it. So can't do that. So uh, let me just recompile it and run it. I mean, I can still store things in a vector and see what they are. Hey, let's see what's in element 10. Remember how that's supposed to crash the program? Oh, it's 65. What? <laughs> I did not put 65 into the vector. Uh, how, what's element 100? I haven't tried this yet. Oh, it's zero. Well, great. Uh, how about element 10,000? Zero. I don't know. It's just basically the, uh, the real vector doesn't do what we call bounds checking. So if you misuse it in certain ways, it just corrupts the memory or goes to random places in memory and just does goofy things. And so it's less noob friendly, less student friendly, I think. So this is one of the main reasons we wrote our own is so that if you have a bug, the bug will sort of jump out and we'll help you find the bug and fix it. Also, I think the idea is that for the most part, our thing will behave pretty similar to the real one. And so once you get to this point in the course, if you really need to learn the real way, it's not that hard to learn to jump to the real one. So at least you didn't have to suffer with this kind of stuff all quarter with these bugs, you know. 
So anyway, that's kind of one of the reasons that we did what we did with our vector. Um, let's talk about this business with like where it said begin and it said end. What's that all about? Well, if you're taking the 106L class, you probably already know a lot of what I'm saying right now. But um, those begin and end are something called iterators. And I might have taught you about this uh, in the course if we had more time. But an iterator is a, a, an idea. It's an abstract concept. It's like a little object that walks across a data structure and gives you access to the elements of the data structure. Why would you need that? Well, if you have a vector and you want to look at the elements of the vector, you could just do a for loop and ask for element i, right? But like, what if you have a set? What if you have a map? It's a little harder to like loop over and get each element. So an iterator is sometimes an object that helps you do that. And the whole point of iterators is maybe if you have many different kinds of collections, maybe all of them could provide an iterator. And then if you just learn how the iterator works, it doesn't really matter if the iterator came from a vector or a set or a map or a queue or a PQ or whatever. It'll work the same way. So that's the idea of what an iterator is. The STL was designed by people who thought this idea was a really nice idea. And so every data structure in STL has two ways that you can ask for iterators. One's called begin and one is called end. And begin is sort of like a little object that starts at the beginning of the structure. And end is like a little object that sits at the end of the structure. And you can use iterators to loop over the contents, forwards or backwards. So like... Here's the, it, it's kind of a funny thing. Like, if you have a vector called v, this is the standard vector, not the Stanford vector. If you make a vector v, you put some elements in it, you can make an iterator, and you set it equal to the begin, and then you can loop until it reaches the end, and you can do plus plus on it to move it forward to the next element. How does that actually work? I mean, plus plus increases an int, right? What do you think is going on here? Like, how did they make it work with that operator? How do they make it that do something to move this iterator around? You know? What do you think? Yeah. It adds the amount of memory gets whatever is in the part. Yeah, it just sort of moves forward by that many bytes in the memory to get to the next place. Yeah. And in terms of the mechanics of the language, they overload this operator so that it'll know how far to go or where to go or something like that. So yeah, anyway, this thing uses syntax that's a little bit like pointers. You can do plus plus and minus minus to move pointers around in the memory. If you want to get the element that the iterator is currently looking at, you use the star operator, which is what you use when you're following a pointer, when you're dereferencing a pointer, we say. So this is a way of looping over a vector. Now you don't need to loop over a vector this way. You could just use a for loop and ask for bracket element i, right? That's simpler than this. So you probably wouldn't write this. But the whole point of this code is you could write the same exact code for a set, for a map, for a whatever. The only difference is instead of vector iterator, you'd say map iterator, set iterator, whatever. So this is meant to homogenize the process of walking along these structures. And if you have an iterator, C++ allows your class to be used with this short syntax called a for each loop. And I know you've used this in class. So this enables this. And you don't have to use this. You, didn't, you never used anything like this in our class this quarter. But actually, secretly, the Stanford collections provide begin and end methods that you probably never saw or used. Maybe, do you ever press dot and it lists all the methods? Did you ever see begin or end in that list? And you're like, what's this? Well, you didn't need them, but that's what they were for. We provided those because those existing made it so you could do for each loops on our collections, which we wanted. We wanted you to be able to do that. We didn't need you to do this directly. So the designers of the STL believed in this model of iterators a lot, and it's baked into everything. Here's another example. I mean, you might say, this is dumb. I don't need iterators. Well, but you can do lots of interesting things with them. Like, you can start at the end, loop until you get to the beginning, minus minus it every time. If the value that the iterator is looking at is odd, I can tell the iterator to erase. So a lot of the methods on the collection, like on the vector, they don't take indexes as parameters. What index do you want to remove from or add to or whatever? They take iterators as parameters. Hey, whatever place in the collection that that iterator is pointing at, put a new element there or delete an element from there. That's kind of the, the idea here. And so this syntax looks a little weird, but it's a nice way of, you could use this exact same piece of code on a map, set, queue, stack, whatever. You just replace vector with, with that collection. So that's kind of cool that that, uh, that that will work on so, much, so many different kind of collections. Yeah? It's a little scary because this is a command to go to a location in memory and erase whatever is there. And there's <laughs> no protection. Memory. 
No, I mean, if you miscode that, you can walk off of the vector and just start erasing crap in your operating system. Am I reading this correctly? I see. How dangerous is this? Yeah, you're, it's like the guy, you ever see the movie Memento, where uh, his memory is erasing itself too often? It's one of my favorite movies. But uh, yeah, how dangerous is this? Well, just to be clear, this is not quite as bare in the memory as it looks. Like when I say, oh, plus, plus, minus, minus, star, that, those are the same operators that people use when they walk around with pointers, but technically they're being <laughs> overloaded and they're not always directly jumping in the memory. A lot of times they're jumping to some function call to handle it carefully. So this is probably not much different in terms of risk versus bracket i, because the bracket operator can walk off the end of the collection too, and so can this. I don't think this is any more or less dangerous. And, uh, you know, this is fine. Once you get used to this style, you could do lots of good things with this, and it's not a bad thing necessarily. But I think the unfortunate thing about it is, like, for you guys, like, think about when we started using collections. That was, like, Friday week one, we started playing with grids. <laughs> Monday week two, we're playing with vectors and stuff, right? I would have had to talk about all this bullshit all the way back then. Stars and plus pluses and end and begin and iterate, like... <laughs> The, the cost of entry is a little bit high here. I think once you know what's up with all this stuff, it's fine. But I did not want to have to talk about that before you even know what a vector is. You know what I mean? And you really can't use a vector to do very much without having to talk about this stuff. And again, it uses syntax that is in line with the syntax of pointers, which you guys didn't know about until, what, week four or five, whatever, right? And I didn't want to talk about that in week two. I didn't feel we were ready I felt like when we were older, we could talk about that topic, you know, at the right time. Um, so anyway, okay, but you might say, well, gosh, they screwed up. They didn't design these collections very well. The iterators, these are poopy. I don't like them. But I'll tell you what, there is a payoff here that is one of my favorite parts of STL, maybe the coolest part, I would say, is the algorithm library. And you probably can't read the font because it's small, but I wanted to emphasize how many things this has. And this is by far not a complete list. There is a library called algorithm, which includes a whole bunch of cool commands and functions and algorithms, basically, that you can use that have to do with data and collections. Things like, you know, divide up your integers uh, around a central partition, make a heap, tur turn any interray into a heap with one function call. That's kind of useful if you're going to make a priority queue. Um, compare characters, look for the minimum, maximum element of a data structure, merge two collections into one. Just look at all this stuff. Shuffle things, remove things, randomize things, sort, swap, transform, all, all of this stuff. Search for things, difference, union, intersection. A million random useful algorithms and functions are packed into this library. So it's very powerful. And once you get to know what's available, you start writing all these cool things. And I'll tell you what, these, you might say, okay, there's a sort command in the STL. And so what do you do? If you have a vector v, do you write v.sort? No. Is there a sort function where you say sort parentheses v? No. The sorting function takes two iterators as parameters. And the iterators are supposed to represent the start and the end of the thing that you're sorting. And it'll, everything in between, it'll sort. And that iterator, those two iterators, could come from anything. It could come from a set, a map, a stack, a queue, a vector, a linked list, what, a string. If you want to sort the characters of a string, you can say s.begin and s.end, if s is a string variable. Any kind of data type that has a begin function and an end function that returns iterators, that sort of kind of represent the start and the end of it. If you have that in your library, in your class, in your collection, in your whatever, you can use all of these algorithms immediately on your thing. That's like really fucking powerful. <laughs> it's cool. And it enables you to do all these really neat things with just one line of code. So it turns out like they do these international programming competitions where they pit a bunch of nerds together and see who could solve tricky algorithmic problems and stuff. You can use one of several languages. Almost always the winning teams pick C++. And it's because of this. It's because you could do magic in one line. If you really know the STL really well, you could just slice and dice and do anything you want to data that came from almost any source. If you want to count how many occurrences of the string Marty are in this set, the set S, you just say count between begin and end. Count is one of the functions from the algorithm package. Count between begin and end occurrences of this. And again, this could be iterators on a map, iterators on a vector, iterators on anything. just works. If I want to know what's the biggest element of a vector, call max element that takes begin and end. 
Why do I say star? Because max element returns an iterator <laughs> pointing at the max element, so I have to write star to go get it. But you know, you could do so much stuff with this. It's very powerful. So I guess what I would say is just, you know, the SDL is probably at the end of the day better and more useful than what we did. But I also realize from practical standpoint that like the majority of you are are done after this week, right? You're you're never going to look at this crap ever again because you're in some other major and you're learning this to help with that and so on. And some of you hopefully will take more CS, maybe major in CS, I hope. And those of you who are doing that might want to learn more about real standard C++, but really for most of you for whom this, you know, this would be the last course you would take, uh, I think it doesn't matter exactly what data structure library you, you learn, right? So these are some of the reasons why we pick the Stanford collection over the standard <laughs> collections. Mostly because of the bad errors or lack of errors, and because of the uh, insistence on basically knowing how pointers work and knowing the syntax for pointers and iterators early, which we didn't want to go into. And there are a lot of little details that are sort of rough edges of the STL if you really start getting into them and using them. You have to kind of learn the language of the STL to really use them well. So anyway, if you actually find this interesting, if you want to know more about this, like, you know, if you're uh, this summer, if you're really, really bored, uh, try rewriting some of your homework solutions to use the STL instead of the Stanford collection. It doesn't take that long, but it's an interesting exercise to see if you could do it without relying on any of our libraries. Also, you know, the 106L course, which a few of you are taking right now, uh, covers the SDL in detail. And so, you know, some of you maybe already know this stuff, maybe better than me, honestly. Uh, so, hey, you could go look at their materials if you want. Or, hey, if you, if you want, you could take STL or uh, uh, 106L in a future quarter. You don't have to take it while you're taking 106B.